Hey guys, Mark Spencer, Spencer Speed Shop, Spencer Cycle Shop. Um, this video could take an hour and a half, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make this abbreviated. I'm gonna tell you to go out and read up and educate yourself on your own. I'm just gonna give you some basis. We're gonna talk about engine vacuum, okay, and the things that can affect engine vacuum, okay. And we're gonna talk about a performance engine now, okay. Now I know there's gonna be a lot of landscapers jumping in here and straighten me out. I understand that, but I'm okay with that, okay. Um, but uh, Engine vacuum, like on a stock, you know, like say, say a 307 two barrel Chevy, you know what I mean? Probably about 20 inches of vacuum, okay? Um, but most of your performance cars, depending on so many things, are 18 inches. And if you got a fairly hot cam and, and a fairly big intake manifold, meaning like you don't have a dual plane intake, um, you can be down around 15, 12 inches of vacuum, okay? And the lower the vacuum, the less the fuel gets atomized. Think of the air coming through the carburetor. The lower the vacuum, the slower the air is coming through, so there's not as much turbulence, and all those fuel droplets coming out of the annular discharges in the carburetor are staying larger, not smaller. And liquids, a liquid gasoline doesn't burn. I, trust me, I know. I got suspended for five days uh, with Mr. Senecola in uh, Auto Shop, where... He was a fireman. He said, gasoline, you got to watch. Because we smoke cigarettes outside near the garage door, you know, an auto shop. And he said, hey, Spencer, you got a can of gas over there. And it was open five-gallon pail. I said, yeah, that's all right. He goes, you're going to blow the whole school up. And it was a cold day. I took my cigarette and I threw it into the bucket. Not the smartest move, but it's the vapors that would light off, not the fuel. The cigarette just died out. Um, and that's back when a teacher could do what he, what he th thought he should do, which was gave me a good shot across the back of the head and not with an open hand, with a fist, you know. But we became tight. We became tight. But I'm getting off subject a little bit, okay? So the higher the vacuum, uh, we're talking about that idle, these numbers. The higher the vacuum, um, the more atomized the fuel is. It's closer to a vapor, which wants to burn. Because if big droplets go into that combustion chamber, they're not all going to burn, Okay. It's, it, it, they, they can't reach out to each other. They're too far away when they get lit off by the spark plug. They're like on the other side of the room. But when you got nice vaporized fuel, it's like you're in a crowded room, okay? You, can, you move it, everybody's touching, okay? So, with that being said, what affects vacuum on a performance car? Um, like I said, vacuum on a stock. We're not talking about injected cars today. We're not talking about, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, all these different types of cars. We're going to say, like, Good old 307 two barrel was probably kicking around 20 inches of vacuum and had a cam that was about 400 lift, two barrel carburetor, Rochester 2GC, okay? Now, your typical car today, we're talking about V8s, big block Chevy, uh, small block Chevy, uh, uh, big block Mopar, whatever it might be. There are so many variables when it comes to vacuum. We could start with the size of the engine, the cam timing, duration, the hang time, how long that valve is off the seat from when it's open until it's closed, okay? The higher duration at 50, the lower your vacuum will be. Now, a 240 cam, 245 degree cam, and a small block Chevy, 350, is going to pull less vacuum than the same duration cam in a 454 Chevy, okay? We got bigger pistons, we got more pull, we got more vacuum, so it's staying atomized, okay? So, Vacuum is affected by cam timing, intake manifold, dual plane or open plane, okay? Single big open hole, okay? That, that's going to drop vacuum. Size of the carburetor, ignition timing, size of the headers, okay? The primary tube on the headers because the bigger the primary tube, the less velocity on that exhaust valve opens, the less velocity you have scavenging the chamber for the next intake charge to come in. Restricted exhaust system, like a... Uh, uh, a 468 Chevy or 502 Chevy with like a two inch exhaust system coming off a little like one and seven eighths two inch primary tubes that's going to have a, a lot of restriction okay and that can kill your vacuum okay having too big of an exhaust system can kill your vacuum too all right so there's all different things that we could talk about now when I'm talking about setting up a car for the street a performance car um a typical good hot rod making 500 plus horsepower, pump gas car, reliable car, um, is probably going to be making 15 to 18 inches of vacuum. Where a factory, like I said, 307 to about 20, 22 inches, okay? And 
When we talk about that vacuum reading, we're talking about in neutral if it's an automatic. You put it in drive, you're going to drop two to three inches of vacuum, okay? Stick shift, it doesn't matter. But this is one of the reasons why I like to have, when I got a car that's got relatively low vacuum, like something that's around uh, below 15 inches, okay? It's not going to have great throttle response, especially if you got like an 850 Holley double pumper with like 323 gears in the rear, okay? Gear ratio is going to affect the load on the engine, which affects the vacuum when you're driving, okay? What we're talking about now, we're sitting in a traffic light, okay? I prefer a vacuum advance distributor, okay, over a mechanical advance for a real street car, okay? Why? Because the vacuum also, if I was running like some low vacuum, like uh, um, like about 13, 14 inches, this would be hooked to manifold vacuum. Manifold vacuum means that this vacuum diaphragm here is going to see the vacuum that I'm reading on my gauge. Ported vacuum is above the throttle blade and means that once you open the throttle blade, then the vacuum comes in. But I know I'm going to get a lot of guys telling me, I don't know what I'm fucking talking about. I do it every day, okay? I get cars that come in here, they can't fall out of a fucking tree. They think I put a 150 pound, uh, 100, 150 horse shot of nitrous in it. Now I'm going to turn the distributor machine on and I'm going to show you what happens in the distributor when the vacuum advance actually gets affected. Okay, so first, let's, let's hold, hold on. There we go. Let's look at the vacuum gauge right here first. Okay, bringing it up. There we go. 15, 16 inches. Now, watch. See where the vacuum canister is? See where it's going into? Right here, this plate right here. It's going to advance and retard that. It's going to make it the sugar as if you're turning it. Watch this. When I apply vacuum to it. Watch this plate move down below the advance weights. That's your mechanical advance right here. That's RPM sensitive. Vacuum advance is load sensitive. So watch this. See the move? See that? And what's happening over here when I'm doing that? Vacuum's going up, okay? So, where I'm going with this is, if I got a car pulling about 15 inches of vacuum, um, and I got about like 16 degrees initial timing, where I'm going like total initial to, total advanced timing, mechanical advanced timing for like 32, 34 degrees, something like that. Um, when I hook up that vacuum advance to manifold vacuum, that a typical vacuum advance gives you about 10 degrees more advance. So if I'm about 16 degrees, say initial timing, I hook that vacuum advance to manifold vacuum. I add 10 degrees timing right off idle. I got 26 degrees timing at idle. And all of a sudden, the vacuum goes up too, okay? Now, other things. Ignition timing affects vacuum. Retarded timing, low vacuum. Advanced, very advanced timing, low vacuum, okay? So you have to know this. Um, compression ratio, um, uh, runners, the size of your runners. There are so many things. Vacuum, there isn't a car that comes in here, I don't care what it's in here for, that I don't check the vacuum on. And also, when I'm adjusting the air fuel ratio on my carburetor, I know everybody tunes my ear. Yeah. And believe me, I can get close, but I can't get perfect without my vacuum gauge here. Turning the air fuel screws in. You turn, you know, on a four barrel carburetor, the primary air fuel adjustments. You turn it a quarter turn, and you wait. You're not going to see an immediate response on this vacuum gauge, because the carbs here, and the manifold's here, but what's going to control the vacuum is what's happening in port velocity down here, okay? So, you're in this town, and the vacuum signal that's going to be generated is in another town. you got to wait about three, four seconds, and you'll see the vacuum will change. You keep going in till you reach the highest vacuum. Then you go to the other one on the primary. Same thing, go for the highest vacuum. Then you back them both out a little bit because they might want to come up a little bit. And you go for the highest reading, and then sometimes you just go a skosh, like an eighth of a turn, richer than the highest vacuum reading. And, by the way, if I'm dealing with a car that's got um, a somewhat tight converter for the engine it should have, um, where when you drop your car in gear, if you've got an automatic transmission, you drop your car in gear, if that idle gets pulled down like a couple hundred RPMs, you got the wrong converter, or you got the wrong cam, okay? When that thing gets pulled down, vacuum drops, so that's another thing. If I got a car with not the proper converter in it, I'm going to adjust the air fuel ratio with the car in gear, okay? 
idling in gear. That's where I go for my best. Um, this, you can find this stuff online, okay? This shows you all things that can happen with a vacuum gauge, all the different reasons, okay? Um, I'm not going to get into all this stuff, okay? Burnt valves, uh, um, uh, um, what else we got here? Uh, sticking valves, and come on, we're talking back, uh, you know, uh, when we had Sunoco 260 at the pump, you know what I mean? Weak valve spring, you can see the way the things are moving, because a typical vacuum gauge right there between green and yellow is going to be 15 inches. Down to the yellow side is 10 inches right there, and over here we're looking at 20 inches, okay? But this is about where you're at with a performance car. I have yet to have a car come in here that I haven't made run better just by knowing what I'm doing. And by the way, when I have to recover the distributor on this machine, the car's not here. For instance, this, this thing is in here for a recurve, but it's no good. MSD strikes again, brand new. There's a, this is a, a, a ready to run, doesn't use a 6AL box. The whole circuit board down beneath, it's blown. Now the guy could have possibly, you know, swapped four of these wires and popped it, but it's a dead player. It's not working, okay? And MSD doesn't sell this piece under here, this circuit board. Send it back to them, give them $195 plus shipping both ways, wait a month and get it back. MSD, okay, multi-stroke dischargers, okay? And by the way, this pickup right here in the MSD, that's a Chrysler electronic ignition pickup. That's all that they use, okay? There's nothing special about their fucking shit. Bill it alone instead of gas aluminum, big fucking deal, okay? And another thing. A good quality vacuum advance will have a little Allen set screw in there that you could put your Allen wrench in and you could turn the wrench and you could increase the spring pressure, which will make the vacuum pull in later, the advance pull in later, or you could decrease the spring pressure and make it pull in sooner. And you could also put a travel limiter in on how much vacuum is actually activated by the vacuum advance canister. Um, I know there's a lot more to cover, but... Uh, I just want to review real quick. Hot rod cars, if you're over cammed, you're going to be in like the 14, uh, 13, 14 inch range. Um, you got to, uh, you know, I, I can't say a specific duration uh, at 50 thou because it depends on the size of the engine. You know, like for instance, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the uh, uh, 260s on my Hemi, okay? Seven and a half to one compression, that's it. But it's a very efficient motor, okay? And I have locked ignition time in there. We'll get into that another day, okay? But um, so this is going back to where guys are saying that I couldn't uh, curve a distributor out the car here. That fucking hand job that was saying that. You give me all the information. You tell me the gear ratio. You tell me the weight of the car. You tell me the vacuum in park, in gear. You tell me the size of the carburetor. You give me the cam specs. You give me all. The, you give me all the information. I've got a sheet. I don't have it handy here. It's 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 a full eight by eight and a half by eleven sheet. With all information I put down, I have yet to send the distributor back to a customer. Give it back to them or send it back where they were not ecstatic. New Zealand. Just sent the distributor back to New Zealand because of my Facebook page, okay? Mate, my car never got up on the back tires like it did before. I can't believe it. You're, you're amazing. What do you drink? I want to send you beer. I'm like, buddy, just, just be happy. That's all that matters, okay? So I'm sure there's a lot of questions to be asked, um, and I'm sure that I... I I told you, I can go on for an hour and a half. This is a, a pretty long video right now, and I'm just hitting on the basics. But let me tell you a couple of things. Streetcar, I'm for a vacuum advance on the distributor. I'm for a vacuum secondary carburetor, unless you're running gears in like the fours and up, okay? Um, I'm for a dual plane intake manifold. Um, but this all can change with cubic inches, okay? There's no replacement for displacement, but we can make a small engine run, we can make a big engine run, okay? But they all... Combustion chamber shape dictates what type of ignition, total ignition timing you want, and um, compression ratio, and uh, what base timing and what advance you want. Total advance is controlled by the shape. Of one combustion chamber is less susceptible to detonation on today's pump gas than another combustion chamber, you know? Like, for instance, my Hemi. I'm running 7.5 to 1 compression. Not a lot, right? You hear the way that thing runs, right? It sounds like a top fuel car, okay? Because it's got a cam. I had custom ground. And when I get on that thing, I'm making 11 pounds of boost, okay? I'm right at the jagged edge, according to Y and the other blower people, of effective compression ratio. The plugs come out brand new. Why? Because of the hemispherical combustion chamber. A Hemi, by the way, like the 426 Street Hemi, 
446 pack would kick the shit out of it all day. It needs compression to run, okay? You got to fill that big chamber up, okay, with a huge dome piston. They ran 10 and a quarter one piston on the street, on the street, Hemi. It didn't fall out of a fucking tree, guys. It always needed a tune, okay, where the race Hemis were 12 and a half to one. Every car in, in top fuel racing, every engine is based on the 426 Hemi. But they're running a supercharger because it's a cross-flow setup. Here's your blower. The intake valve is here. It comes into the chamber. The exhaust valve is there. It comes in and out. It doesn't go in, make a U-turn, and then go out like a wedge chamber, okay? So a Hemi will tolerate more boost in a blower application on pump gas than a wedge chamber would. I know. Joey's landscaping is going to tell me I'm crazy and tell me about his brother or his cousin or his father or whatever. I'm ready for it. Okay, guys. Nobody's watching this all the way through. Mark Spencer, Spencer Speed Shop, Spencer Cycle Shop. Goodbye.